हाय बच्चों वेलकम टू द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ द रिविजन वीडियोस इन ऑप्स इन दिस पार्ट आई एम गोइंग टू कवर द रिमेनिंग टॉपिक्स लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल वी आर गोइंग टू कवर क्विकली इंस्ट्रूमेंटल डिलीवरी वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द थर्ड स्टेज कॉम्प्लिकेशंस पोस्ट पार्टम हैमरेज एक्टिव मैनेजमेंट ऑफ थर्ड स्टेज ऑफ लेबर देन एपिजोटमी सिजेरियन सेक्शन फीटल मॉनिटरिंग ऑल्सो आई विल ऑल्सो कवर एन्यूप्लॉयरी स्क्रीनिंग ओवर हियर एंड वी विल बी कवरिंग प्रिपेरियम इन अ वेरी वेरी क्विक मैनर राइट so coming to the first thing and that is active management of third stage of labor which is very very important you can expect one question from active management now active management of third stage of labor the advantage is that it is going to de decrease the duration of the third stage of uh, labor it decreases blood loss it decreases the chances of pph and that is why active management of third stage of labor is the best method to prevent pph now there are four steps in active management of third stage of labor which you have to know the number one step is injection utero tonic within 1 minute of delivery of the baby or immediately after the delivery of the anterior shoulder this first step is the most important step in amtsl number 2 is delayed cord clamping where the cord is clamped between 1 to 3 minutes please remember delayed cord plank Uh, cord clamping is a part of AMTSL, but early cord clamping is not a part of AMTSL. Then third step is delivery of the placenta by controlled cord traction or modified brand and use technique. This step should be undertaken only if a skilled birth attendant is present. And fourth step is intermittent assessment of uterine tone. Earlier, the fourth step was uterine massage, but now uterine massage is a part of management of PPH. It is not a part of AMTSL. right now coming to the first step the details of uh, first step and that is number 1 injection utrotonic now the utrotonic which is recommended by who is oxytocin and the dose which you have to give to prevent pph and am tsl is 10 international units which you can give either im or by iv infusion the one which is preferred is iv infusion this is because when you give by iv infusion the onset of action happens within 1 minute whereas when you give by im the onset of action happens in 3 minutes so now when you give by im the action stays for a longer time that is 3 hours when you give by iv infusion the action stops after 1 hour right then uh, if uh, who says if oxytocin is not available then you can go to alternative drugs like methyl ergometrin or methergin the dose is 0.2 mg which you have to give im we don't give it as iv because then it leads to severe hypertension then number 3 you can give a fixed dose combination of oxytocin and methyl ergometrin which is sintometrin where oxytocin is present in 5 international units and methyl ergometrin is 0.5 mg this fixed dose combination it is expensive number 1 and it is not readily available right then you can go for carbitocin carbitocin is a synthetic oxytocin right and because it's a synthetic oxytocin that is why it has a longer t half normally uh, the t half of oxytocin is very short it is 3 to 5 minutes right now the dose of carbitocin which you have to give is 100 micrograms slow iv then you can go for mesoprost that is pge1 which you have to give 600 micrograms orally for management of amt sl now latest reports say that you can also give 400 to 600 100 micrograms right then who recommends now because this is the uh, misoprost is available in tablet form and this is the only utrotonic which is available in tablet form that is why who recommends that in remote areas where you know a lot of uh, phcs are not there or where the care to a patient will not be present center uh, you know that these females are not going to come to uh, for delivery to institutions you can give them misoprost in the antenatal period so that if they have bleeding they can uh, take this tablet orally right that is what who recommends now please remember carboprost which is pgf2 alpha is used for management of pph and is not used in active management of third stage of labor now in high risk patients who says that a combination of oxytocin plus tranexamic acid can be used for active management of third stage of labor 
Yes. So tranexamic acid, yes, it can be used for active management of third stage of labor. Uh, the other thing which I want to tell you that is the first step. So we've done the first step, everything related to oxytocin. Just now I let you know. Now comes the second step. Second step is delayed cord clamping. Please remember delayed cord clamping is a part of active management of third stage of labor. Early cord clamping is not a part of active management of third stage of labor. What do you understand by early cord clamping? When the cord is clamped within one minute of delivery, now, if they ask you what are the indications for early cord clamping, the single best answer for early cord clamping is if neonate needs resuscitation. This could be in case of birth asphyxia. Or if the baby is a known case of congenital heart disease in RH negative females, if indirect comb test is negative. That means in non-ISO immunized pregnancies. Now, as far as HIV patients are concerned, our NACO guidelines say that you have to go for early cord clamping, but ACOG guidelines say that you have to go for delayed cord clamping. In case of RH negative females, please remember that overall the answer for RH negative female is that you have to go for early cord clamping. But suppose they are specifically telling you that indirect comb test is positive. Indirect comb test positive means already antibodies are formed against fetal RH antigen. So in this case, there is no use of doing early cord clamping. In this case, you have to go for delayed cord clamping. Similarly, if they try to confuse you by asking you what is the type of cord clamping which is done in preterm babies, in macrosomic babies, in post-term babies, in COVID-19 patients, always you have to go for delayed cord clamping. The answer for early cord clamping is when neonatal resuscitation is required or babies in own case of congenital heart disease or in RH negative pregnancy birth asphyxias, right? Now, Coming to what all you need to know on oxytocin. Now, oxytocin, please remember, natural oxytocin is a nonapeptide which is synthesized by paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and it is stored in posterior pituitary. T half of oxytocin is 3 to 5 minutes. It can be given as IM or by IV infusion, as I told you, in AMTSL and in management of PPH, it is preferred to be given as IV infusion. You should never give it as IV bolus because if you give it as IV bolus, it can lead to hypotension and it can lead to cardiac arrest. Now, whenever you are preparing an infusion of oxytocin, you should always use ringer electrolyte-rich media like ringer lactate or normal saline. You should not put it in a dextrose 5% solution because otherwise it can lead to water intoxication or hyponatremia. Now, oxytocin is a hormone which is responsible for milk ejection. Then coming to the second drug, details about methyl ergometrin. Methyl ergometrin, it can lead to tetanic uterine contractions. Please remember, oxytocin leads to physiological contractions in the uterus. Now, Whereas whenever you are using methyl ergometrin, it leads to tetanic contractions of the uterus. It acts more on the lower uterine segment in comparison to the upper uterine segment. And methyl ergometrin can lead to transient severe hypertension. That is why there are certain contraindications for use of methyl ergometrin, which you can remember by the mnemonic topper, where T stands for after the delivery of first twin, O stands for organic heart disease or any heart disease, P stands for peripheral vascular disease, E stands for eclampsia and preeclampsia and R stands for RH negative females. A relative contraindication is HIV positive female who is on protease inhibitor. Please remember in all those conditions where methyl ergometrin is contraindicated, oxytocin can be used. Then we have prostaglandins like mesoprost that is PGE1. PGE1 as I told you is available in a tablet format. Right, You can give it orally, you can give it sublingually or you can give it per rectally. It is water soluble and heat soluble. Its main side effect is dose related hyperthermia. So patient is going to have fever and shivering. Now they ask you by which route you should not use it for active management of third stage of labor or for PPH. You should not use it per vaginally. This is because the drug can be washed off when a patient is having excessive bleeding. T half of mesoprost is 20 to 40 minutes and you can give it to asthmatics. Right, carboprost or PGF2 alpha, which is also called as dinoprost or hembate, it is available in injection form. The route which you have to give is intramuscularly. It is absolutely contraindicated in asthmatics, in patients of pulmonary hypertension, and in cases of suspected amniotic fluid embolism. Its side effect is diarrhea. This is the best drug to manage PPH, but it is not used for active management of third stage of labor.
right? Now, uh, so all the steps of active management of third stage of labor, they are very, very important. Please remember that early cord clamping is not a part of active management of third stage of labor. And the fourth step now is intermittent assessment of uterine tone. So uterine tone has to be assessed when they ask you how often are you going to assess the uterine tone. So uterine tone has to be assessed every 15 minutes, right, for two hours after delivery, right? Okay. Now, coming to very important thing and that is retained placenta. Now, before we go into retained placenta, quickly revise what are the signs of placental separation. So, the first sign is that you are going to get a gush of blood per vaginally. Then there will be a suprapubic bulge. There will be lengthening of the cord and this lengthening of the cord will be apparent lengthening of the cord, but it will be permanent, right? And the height of the uterus will slightly increase. The surest sign of placental separation is if you can feel the placenta in vagina. Right? If you can feel placenta in vagina, that's the surest sign of placental separation. The second best is lengthening of the cord. That is apparent and permanent lengthening of the cord. Now, when we are talking about placental separation, what is the most common method for placental separation? The most common method for placental separation is Schultz method. In Schultz method, it is a central method here. The placenta separates from the center, right? So, placenta will separate from the center, number one. So, there will be formation of retroplacental clot, right? And because there is formation of retroplacental clot, that is why there is less bleeding. In this case, it is the shiny fetal side which comes out first. Shiny fetal side comes out first, right? And the bleeding will be apparent only after the entire placenta has separated. In contrast, what is the second method? That is Duncan method. And in Duncan method, it is peripheral separation. Right? Which of them was most common? The Schultz method was more common. Right? Now, coming to retained placenta, there can be three categories of retained placenta. First category could be that the placenta has separated from the uterus, but it is not expelled because the internal os gets closed. Right? This is what is called as a trapped placenta. How do I come to know that the placenta is trapped? Because all signs of placental separation will be seen. Now, whenever I have a condition like this, I'm going to empty the patient's bladder and then I'm going to see whether the uterus is relaxed or whether it is contracted. If uterus is relaxed, I am going to give oxytocin because uh, the most important factor which is responsible for delivery of the placenta or separation of the placenta is uterine contractions, right? But if I see that the uterus is already contracted and the internal loss is closed, then I have no other method except for manual removal of placenta. A second situation could be that the placenta is still attached to the uterus, but it is not a morbidly adherent condition, like it is not placenta accreta spectrum. So in this, the signs of placental separation will be absent. Right? In this case, you have to give oxytocin plus you have to go for controlled cord traction and if it fails, then you are going to go for manual removal of placenta. A third situation is that the placenta is not separating because the chorionic villi are invading the myometrium. That is what is called as placenta accreta spectrum. In placenta accreta spectrum, the next step is hysterectomy. Right now, if at any point of time while you are doing controlled cord traction, if cord breaks and they ask you what is the next step, next step is manual removal of placenta. Clear to all of you coming to placenta accreta spectrum? So in placenta accreta, the, which is the most common variety in placenta accreta spectrum, the villi are attached partially. So either the word partially will be written or superficially to the myometrium. In case of Placenta in crita, the villi invade the myometrium, right? And in case of placenta per crita, villi are attached to serosa. Right, the two main pathologies which are responsible for placenta accreta spectrum are absent decidua basalis. So there is a, the defective decidua basalis and there is absent neta layer. 
Nita Buxlayer is absent. The two most important risk factors for placenta accreta spectrum are if in present pregnancy patient has placenta previa and if there is past history of cesarean section. These are the two most important risk factors for placenta accreta spectrum. Investigation of choice is ultrasound that is TVS. Now, on ultrasound, you are going to get number one, moth-eaten placenta, moth-eaten appearance of the placenta or you get placental lakes. Number two, there is loss of hypoechoic area which is normally seen behind the placenta which represents decidua basalis. And number three, normally you get a white line from the bladder to uterine serosa. Right, And this is what is the bladder uterine serosa interface. Now imagine if there is a placenta per crita, there will be disruption of this continuous white line. So if any of these three things are mentioned in your questions as ultrasound findings, it means they are hinting at placenta accreta spectrum and then the management becomes hysterectomy. You have to go for hysterectomy. Right now, coming to a very, very important obstetrical emergency that is postpartum hemorrhage. How do you define postpartum hemorrhage? Whenever there is blood loss more than 500 ml in vaginal delivery or more than one liter after cesarean section, please remember ACOG says that blood loss more than one liter, irrespective of the type of delivery. That is what is PPH. What is the most common cause of PPH? The most common cause of PPH is atonic uterus. What is the most common cause of primary PPH? Primary PPH is any PPH which is happening in less than 24 hours of delivery. Again, the most common cause is atonic uterus. What is the most common cause of secondary PPH? Secondary PPH is any PPH which is happening beyond 24 hours but up till 12 weeks of delivery and the most common cause is retained placental tissue right and whenever there is retained placental tissue what is the next step next step will be dilatation and curettage and uh, dilatation and curettage which is done in the postpartum period can lead to Asherman syndrome great now how do you manage atonic PPH? The first step what you have to do whenever you have a patient of PPH please call for help and go for resuscitative measures you will immediately start resuscitative measures in which you will put two large bore IV cannulas. When you say two large bore IV cannula, it has to be cannula number 14 and 16. Simon is, simultaneously, you are going to take out samples for ABORH, coagulation profile, in coagulation profile, serum fibrinogen and serum electrolyte levels. Right, then you are going to catheterize the patient so that you can monitor her urine output and you are going to give oxygen by mask. Right, now once you have done this, move your hands onto the uterine uh, uterus, do a per abdominal examination and simultaneously massage the uterus. If you are seeing that the tone of the uterus is decreased, right, tone of the uterus is decreased, it means you are dealing with atonic PPH. Now, once you know you, the, you are doing massage, now you are also going to tell one of your assistants or someone is going to do uterine massage for you and you are going to shift to a pervaginal examination. Why are you doing a pervaginal examination? To rule out presence of any membranes or placental tissue which is not allowing the uterus to contract, right? So once you've ruled out there is no uh, placental tissue or membranes inside, then your diagnosis of atonic PPH is confirmed. Once your diagnosis of atonic PPH is confirmed, you're going to do three steps. You are going to now do a bimanual massage. Bimanual massage means that your one hand will be in the form of a fist in the uh, fornix of the vagina and the other hand will be per abdominal behind the uterus, fundus of the uterus. That is wine manual massage, number one. Number two, you are going to give uterotonic and as a, you know, the uterotonic of the, which is recommended by WHO is oxytocin and the dose which you have to give is 20 international units in 500 ml of normal saline. And simultaneously, you are going to give tranexamic acid. Please remember, one gram tranexamic acid is added to 100 ml of normal saline and it is infused over 10 to 20 
20 minutes for good results tranexamic acid it should always be begun within 3 hours of pph right now this you are going to do right now if suppose oxytocin is and tranexamic acid are not able to control bleeding then you are going to go to methyl ergometrin methyl ergometrin the dose is 0.2 mg im and it can be repeated after every two to four hours remember that mesoprost is an add-on drug it is not an alternative drug if bleeding is not getting controlled by oxytocin and by methargin the next step is never mesoprost it's an add-on drug which you can give Mesoprost dose to control PPH as recommended by WHO is 800 micrograms which you have to give orally or sublingually. WHO does not recommend giving uh, mesoprost per rectally for managing PPH. ACOG says that the dose of mesoprost can be anywhere between 600 to uh, 600 micrograms to 1000 micrograms and ACOG says you can give it orally, sublingually or per rectally. But remember mesoprost is an add-on drug. It is not the next next drug ever right now if bleeding is not con getting controlled by oxytocin tranexamic acid and methyl ergometrin then before you shift to the next step you should always give carboprost which is pgf2 alpha the other name for carboprost is dinoprost or dinoproston or hempate right now uh, carboprost is in the form of injections the dose is 250 micrograms intramuscularly it has to be repeated after every 15 to 90 minutes and you can repeat it maximum up till 8 times which means maximum dose which you can give is 2 milligrams now if bleeding is not getting controlled by medical measures then you have to go for mechanical compression and in mechanical compression we use a buckley balloon catheter the maximum capacity of buckley balloon catheter is 500 cc right if bleeding co uh, continues in spite of doing mechanical compression with the buckley balloon catheter the next step is compression sutures the most commonly used compression sutures are the uh, b link sutures b link sutures are applied along the anterior posterior wall of the uterus like this Right, the other sutures whose name just you have to remember are Heyman suture, Gunshella suture, and a Cho square suture. Right, if bleeding continues in spite of going for compression sutures, then you have to go for stepwise devascularization. This stepwise devascularization can be done operatively or it can be done by an interventional radiologist. In stepwise de uh, devascularization, the first artery which you are going to ligate is uterine artery. Right, uh, followed by the ovarian artery, the branch, the branch of ovarian artery which anastomoses with uterine artery. Right now, one very important question which they ask you is, what is the most common site of ureteric injury? Please remember that most common site for ureteric injury is. 2 cm lateral to internal os where it is crossed by uterine artery. Where it is crossed by the uterine artery. This is called as water under bridge. Right? Now, if after uh, bilaterally, this has to be done bilaterally. Now, if after stepwise devascularization also the bleeding doesn't stop, then you have to check the vitals of your patient. If vitals of your patient are unstable, immediately you will go to subtotal hysterectomy. But if vitals of your patient are stable, which is unlikely, then you are going to go for internal iliac artery ligation. This internal iliac artery ligation, you have to do anterior division of an internal iliac artery ligation. This is because uterine artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. Now, if this internal iliac artery ligation fails to control the bleeding, the last step which you have is subtotal hysterectomy. Now, even after subtotal hysterectomy, if your patient is bleeding, then you have to apply pelvic pressure packs. The pelvic pressure packs which you apply, their names are umbrella pack and parachute pack.
Clear? So that is how you manage postpartum hemorrhage patients. Now, whenever a patient comes to you with postpartum collapse or a question comes on postpartum collapse, which is very, very common these days, there are three differential diagnoses you are going to keep in mind. Number one is PPH. Number two is uterine inversion. And number three is amniotic fluid embolism. Right. Now, if your question says, what is the most common cause of collapse after delivery? Your answer is PPH. If your question says, what is the most common cause of shock immediately after delivery? If a patient is going into shock immediately after delivery, then it is because of uterine inversion. And if your question says, patient goes into shock and she has difficulty in breathing or she has DIC, that means they are talking about amniotic fluid embolism. Right. Coming to uterine inversion, uterine inversion means prolapse of the fundus of the uterus into the uterine cavity. So this means that if they show you these two images as spotters and they ask you which one is uterine inversion and which one is prolapse. So in the image, wherever you are able to see internal os. So if internal os is visible, if the os is visible, it means it's a case of uterine prolapse. If os is not visible, it means it is an inside out uh, uterus which has come out. In other words, it is a case of uterine inversion. In uterine inversion, you are never going to see the os, whereas in case of prolapse, because in uterine inversion, the uterus has inverted and it has come out, right? Now, what is the most common cause of uterine inversion? That is mismanaged third stage of labor. Mismanaged third stage of labor. The placenta did not separate and you pulled it with the help of controlled cord traction. So not only will the placenta come out, the uh, uterus will also come out along with it. You should suspect uterine inversion whenever a patient goes into immediate shock after delivery. In case of uterine inversion, the initial shock which you get is neurogenic shock and that is why it is so immediate. Later on, it leads to hemorrhagic shock because now the uterus is lying outside. So the tone of the uterus decreases and it leads to hemorrhagic shock. Death is due to hemorrhagic shock. On per abdominal examination, in case of uterine inversion, you will feel a cup-like depression just below the umbilicus because the height of the uterus immediately after delivery is just below the umbilicus. Or you can say the fundus will be depressed. On per vaginal examination, you will get uh, the patient will have bleeding and a globular mass will be felt inside the vagina. Right Now, how do you manage uterine inversion? Again, it's an obstetrical emergency, so you have to call for help. Number two, you have to stop oxytocin and then you have to try manual replacement of the uterus. Manual replacement of the uterus is called as Johnson's technique. Please remember, do not try to separate the placenta. Please don't try to separate the placenta. Without separating the placenta, stop the oxytocin and try to manually replace the uterus. Now, if this fails, you know, if this step fails, then you have to give tocolytic. And after giving a tocolytic, again, you have to try manual replacement of the uterus. Now, if this also fails, then you have to go for abdominal surgery. The name of the abdominal surgery is Huntington method. Right. And if constriction ring is present, then Haltane surgery. So just the names of the surgeries which you have to remember. Some outdated methods for uh, management of uterine inversion are Osolivan hydrostatic method and spinally surgery, that is a vaginal surgery. Now, once replacement has been done, then you are going to stop the tocolytic, you are going to remove the placenta, you are going to start oxytocin to prevent reinversion, and you are going to give antibiotics.